continually. Amen. In order for them and these truths to be established in our hearts. Now we are going to read, first of all, out of the book of Exodus, chapter number 6. And I will tell you ahead of time that this is where the Lord has appeared to Moses. Moses has been 40 years raised in Egypt. Now he is 40 years on the backside of a desert. He is a Hebrew child. And, um, and God has appeared to him and is speaking to him out of the burning bush and calling him and ordaining him to go back into Egypt and to bring forth the children of Israel. So in Exodus chapter 6, verse number 2, And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. Now, we're going to get this, and many of you heard this, but this is fine, that in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, whenever you see the word Lord in all capital letters, capital L-O-R-D, um, that is the King James translator's way of using the word Jehovah. And that's the word, that's the word we use. Then we're going to get real technical and let you know that nobody really in the earth today knows for sure the proper pronunciation of the word Jehovah. Literally, no Hebrews know it. They will tell you they do not. And um, so it was uh, YHVH, JHVH, Jehovah, Jehovah, uh, Jehovah, Yahweh. Uh, nobody knows for sure exactly how to pronounce that. And... Um, and it's very, very interesting because there was a prophecy in Jeremiah where God said, I will take my name out of their mouth. God said, I will take my name out of their mouth. And he did it. And to this day, they literally, nobody knows how it ought to be pronounced. So we, we say the word Jehovah, and sometimes, a few times, the King James translators will put in the Jehovah, J-E-H-O-V-A-H, Jehovah, and uh, understanding that when the Hebrew was given, uh, originally it was all consonants. There were no vowels in the Hebrew language. At all, whatsoever. The entire Old Testament was written without one vowel. It wasn't until the Masorites of Middle Europe, the Jews there, began to put in the vowel system and um, etc. to help words become more easily understood, etc. But so God is now here, all of that aside. He's speaking to Moses, said, I am the Lord, I am Jehovah. That's the term, that's how we, we use it. But the King James translator said, Lord. And then he says in verse 3, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty. That in the Hebrew is El Shaddai. El Shaddai. And so that's how God knew Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He appeared unto them and introduced himself as God Almighty, or Almighty God, El Shaddai. He said, but by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I introduced myself to them as God Almighty, El Shaddai. By my name, Jehovah, was I not known unto them. Now, that's a very, very interesting statement because we're going to go back to Abraham we're going to go to chapter 22 of the book of Genesis, and it is the it is the time and the moment God has spoke to Moses, excuse me, Abraham, said, take thy son, thine only son, to the top of a mount where I will show thee and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice unto me. So Abraham goes, he goes three days journey into the wilderness, a type of three days of, of death, burial, and resurrection, and uh, three days in the grave. Anyway, they go three days into the wilderness, and uh, he tells his servants, wait here, the lad and I will go up. He takes a bucket of coals, a sharp knife, takes a bundle of wood, 
goes up and he he lays Isaac on the sticks, on the wood, and he raises the knife and the Lord speaks to him and said, don't touch him. Now I know, now I know that you fear me above all. Okay. Then in verse 13, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. In the stead of his son. Okay, notice verse 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, which is Yahweh provides, the Lord provideth. Jehovah Jireh, he provided that ram. He called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, and is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now, I do want to cause you to pause, take note. When God later, hundreds of years, 400 years later, appears to Abraham, excuse me, appears to Moses, and he said, I am the Lord, okay? By my name, Jehovah, was I not known unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew me by God Almighty. They did not know me by Jehovah. And yet, right here, we see Abraham calling the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. So, Abraham did know the name. But God said he did not know the name. So, if you have a case of him pronouncing the name... And then, hundreds of years later, God stating, he didn't know me by that name. Then, uh, there could be a problem. But there is no problem at all, whatsoever. There is no problem with the word of the Lord. God did not forget that day. But what he's telling us is excruciatingly important. We really have to wrap our minds around this. Abraham, if he were praying, the God of heaven introduced himself as El Shaddai. That means the Lord that blesseth thee, or the God that blesseth thee. El Shaddai, God the blesser. Okay? But, so that's the main way that Abraham knew God was, he was a blessing God. And you think about all of the blessings that God heaped upon Abraham and all of the promises that God heaped upon Abraham, as well as Isaac, as well as Jacob. Okay, they they knew him as the Lord that blessed them. And God blessed them everywhere they turned. Even Jacob under the uh, austere hand of, of his uh, father-in-law Laban. God would keep blessing him. He would rob and change Jacob's wages ten times, but he couldn't outstrip Jacob or his God. Everywhere he turned, God would bless Jacob. He was El Shaddai, the Lord that blesseth thee. Okay? So Abraham knew the word Jehovah, but he didn't need to know God in the terms that Moses was going to use the name Jehovah. Jehovah, among other things, and it is an enigmatic name, but one of the connotations of that name is deliverer. Well, what was Moses going to do? He was going to be used of God to deliver two to three million Jews out from under the heavy hand of Pharaoh. He needed to know God was more than a God that blessed. He needed to know that God was a God that delivered. And so God is introducing himself to Moses. He's calling him into the calling of his life. 
And he says, they knew me as El Shaddai, but they didn't really know me as Jehovah. I'm introducing myself to you, not as God Almighty, but as El Sh- uh, but as Jehovah God. Okay, real quickly, El Shaddai. Notice the times God introduced himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In 17.1, it was Abraham when Abram was 90 uh, years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram, said unto him, I am the almighty God. I am El Shaddai. Walk before me, be thou perfect. Okay, now, this is not the first introduction to uh, Abraham, but, but it is the way that he knew him. Okay, in Genesis 28 and 3, and El Shaddai, God almighty, speaking to Isaac, bless thee, make thee fruitful. Multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. El Shaddai, the Lord that blesses. And he's telling him, he's going to bless him. 3511, it's Jacob's turn. God said unto him, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful, multiply. I'm the Lord that blesseth thee. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. So that's the God they knew. He was El Shaddai. He was a God that blessed them everywhere they turned. And the one time, as it were, where God uh, spoke to Abraham, he said, don't touch the boy. God provides the ram, and it was the deliverer provided. The deliverer provided. He provided himself a lamb. Okay, so now Abraham knew the name. He could pronounce the name. He could utter the name. But as far as intimately knowing God in that realm, he knew him far better as El Shaddai than he did Jehovah. So he knew the name, but didn't know, really know the name. Okay? So many people today can utter around the world, they know the name Jesus. They can utter it. Uh, Very sad to say, but as of a few years ago, the name Jesus Christ became the foremost cursing words in America. How horrible. How horrible. The only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And it's America's chief curse word. More than D-A-M-N. More than G-O-D-D-A-M-N. It's the name of Jesus Christ. Using it as an, as a, an atrocious curse word. Well, it shows they know the name. They know the words. But it's also very obvious they don't know the name Jesus. If they really knew the name of Jesus and what it represents, they wouldn't be using it like that. They wouldn't be, not not like that. So they know it, but they don't know it. Likewise, there are many religious people that say they know the name of Jesus and even who he is. But we're going to talk today about who Jesus really, really is. So that when we call on Jesus Christ, we know who we are really talking to. Who we are really talking to. That's huge. Okay, now, one thing to remember about the Hebrew people is the the Jewish people are monotheistic. Okay, as are the Muslims monotheistic. Now, there's said to be three monotheistic belief systems in the world. Judaism, Muslims, Mohammedism, a Muslim religion, and Christianity. Technically, that's what is the phrase that is used. But when that is ever uttered to someone that knows Judaism that is a Jew, or someone that really is a Muslim, and you say that Christianity is monotheistic religion, Listen to me. Trust me. They cringe. 
they cringe. They really cringe. It sets their teeth on edge. The reason being, they do not in any way, shape, or form believe that Christianity, as basically is understood by the world, is a monotheistic religion. They do not believe that it is at all. Because they state, and with obvious, like, duh-ism, truth, how can you say there is one God, but this one God is made up of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And you're going to call that monotheistic? And their eyebrows go up and they just, they shake their head because they know that is not monotheistic any more than is, in a sense, Hinduism that will speak of the one force, but also knows that they, they, they feel like they know that there's 33 million gods. Okay? What's the difference between three and 33 million? It's more than one. And, and so, so if I'm dealing with a Muslim person and far more often with uh, someone of Jewish persuasion and through the years I've met several rabbis and I became very, very good close friends with one of them. And, uh, but uh, in, my, in my remarks to them, I will, I will let them know. I say, now look, I'm monotheistic. I don't expect them to fall out. So, whoo, that's awesome. You know, they smile. And I say, no, I, I want you to know I'm, I, I'm truly monotheistic. I said, I'm strict monotheistic. Okay? That always gets their attention. And I say, I do not believe in a trinity. I do not believe that God is made up of three persons in the Godhead. And every time that stops them in their tracks with statements like, you're kidding. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. And the rabbi that became a very, very close friend of mine, uh, Abraham Rach, he, uh, when I told him that, I said, we do not believe that there is a trinity. We believe there is one supreme God all by himself. His next statement was, well, that didn't make, that wouldn't have made you very popular at Nicaea in 325 AD, would it? Which is where the doctrine of the Trinity came from. 325 AD. Now forget your wife's birthday. Forget your anniversary. <clears throat> forget your birthday. But don't forget 325 AD. 325 AD is where and when the doctrine of the Trinity was formulated. And then if you really want to get technical, 80, 80 years later, they put the capstone on it at the, capital, at the uh, conference in Cappadocia where they figured out uh, as it were, what to do with the uh, Holy Ghost, etc. So, <clears throat> it's one thing to say you know the name of Jesus. It's another thing to realize that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is God. Now, when you begin to get that revelation... We're really on to something. Okay, now, let's go back. The Jews, monotheistic, strict monotheistic. David, King David, and all of Israel knew and believed that Israel was one God. This is why in 2 Samuel 7, 22, David talking to Jehovah God. Wherefore, thou art great, O Lord God. Notice this. And there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. We know. Now, you understand, David is many centuries removed from Moses. They have been in the promised land for three centuries, four and a half centuries by David's time. And... and and, and, and he said, according to all that we know, you are God. You are God all by yourself. There's no God beside you. There's none like you. 
So David was a good Israeli. He was strict monotheistic. Not two gods, not three. Just one. Just one. Isaiah 42 and 8. The Lord is speaking. And he said, I am the Lord. Okay, L-O-R-D, capital. Capitalized. I am Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahweh. I am Jehovah. That is my name. And notice this. My glory will I not give to another. Jehovah God. There's one God. There's none like him. There's no God next to him. And Jehovah God said that his glory he will not be giving to anybody else. He will not give his glory to another. Nobody gets it but him. Isaiah 43 and 10. Further describing himself. He's talking to Israel. He said, Israel, if you please, ye are my witnesses, saith the Jehovah, the Lord. And my servant, you are my witnesses, you are my servant whom I have chosen. He chose Israel out of all nations of the earth to declare his truth, his majesty, that there is but one God. So I chose you that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. That's singular. I am he, I'm not them. I am he, and understand that I am he, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. There's no God before me, there's no God after me. Verse 11, I, that is very singular, even I, very singular, am the Lord Jehovah, and Beside me, next to me, to the left, to the right of me, there is no Savior. The one God, Jehovah God, said, I'm He. I chose you that you would know and believe me. There's no God formed after me. There'll not be another God, no God formed before me. There'll not be another God formed after me. I even I am Jehovah, you're my witnesses, beside me, there's no Savior. Next to me, there is no Savior. I'm it. Okay? Isaiah 46 and then verse 8. So thus saith the Jehovah, the Lord the king of Israel, and I'm his redeemer. I'm Israel's king. I'm Israel's redeemer. I am the Jehovah of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Okay, verse 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told you from that time... And have declared it. Ye are even my witnesses. Okay. I'm the first. I'm the last. Beside me. Next to me. There's no God. I even I am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. Now. God is omniscient. Meaning. He knows everything. There's not one thing that God doesn't know. Except one. There's one thing. One thing God doesn't know. And there are some people that think they're smarter than God in this. There's one thing God doesn't know. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. That's the one thing God doesn't know. He doesn't know another God. There is no God. He said, there's no God beside me. So if someone says, well, there's the Father, but next to him on the left hand is the the Holy Ghost, you know, the the bird, the dove. I don't want to be a smart aleck, but that's the way the paintings depict it. 
I could show you a plethora of paintings. I have in my computer 18 different paintings, religious paintings, describing the Trinity. And in most of them, the Holy Ghost is shown as to be a dove. And he's on the left of the old man with the beard. I'm not being a smart aleck. It's the way it does. And on the right is the son. And you wonder why the Jews have a hard time with that. And you wonder why the Muslims have a hard time with that. And you're going to call it a monotheistic religion? That's why it doesn't impress them. They're not impressed with Christianity calling themselves monotheistic. <clears throat> okay? If I stood up here and said, I never told you this before, folks, but I, I feel like it's time to tell you. I'm a St. Bernard. Why are you laughing? I can bark. I can bite. I can eat like one. I'm a St. Bernard. If I kept that up, I'd be telling that to people and I'd have a straight jacket on. If I kept it up vociferously enough, I'd be in a, I'd be in a room with padded cell and scream to the world, I am a St. Bernard. And they'd say, the poor guy's crazy. You cannot have a depiction of three persons in a Godhead and say, but I'm one. Because the one God said, I'm the first, I'm the last. Beside me, there is no God. Okay, Ivan, I am Jehovah. Beside me, there is no Savior. This is what the Jews, these are scriptures of the Old Testament. This is why the Jews believe, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And God told the Jews, he said, when you wake up your kids in the morning, you wake them up telling them, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And I know I don't pronounce it right, but, but Shema, Yo, Israel, Adonai, El, Hedonai, Adonai, Echud. And every morning when my kids were little, I'd wake them up. Shema yo Israel. I don't know how to I don't know I could. And Shema yo Israel. I don't know how to I don't know I could. I'd wake them up every morning, letting them know there's one God. There's one God. There's one God. There's one God. There's not two gods. There's not three gods. There's one God. There's one God. There's one God. There's one God. David said, all we know according to our ears. You're God by yourself. There's nobody next to you. That's the Hebrew God. One Jehovah God. Okay? Isaiah 45, verses 21 through 23. Who hath declared this? If I can put this in truth. Who hath declared this from ancient times? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, the Jehovah? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Why does God keep repeating this? Over and over. And I'm just going to give you a smidgen of scriptures. The Bible's full of it. Why does he teach it over and over and over and over? Because repetition is the mother of all teaching. And he wanted them to know there's one God. There's one God. There's not two. There's not three. There's not seven. There's not 12. There's not 33 million. There's one God. One God. One God. One God. Beside me, there is no Savior. That's all there is. That's all there ever will be. There's one God. There's one God. There's one God. A just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there's none else. So if we're going to be saved, he said, all the ends of the earth, you have to look to that Jehovah God. That's Jehovah God said, look unto me. There is no Savior beside me. If you're going to be saved all the ends of the earth, you have to look to me, to Jehovah God, in order to be saved. Verse 23, I have sworn by myself. 
The word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. Notice this, what Jehovah God says, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Every knee that bows and every tongue that swears is going to bow to Jehovah God. That He is God. He's the Savior. There's none beside Him. There's none else. There's none before Him. There's none after Him. He's it. Okay? Now, Mark, this is New Testament. This is Jesus Christ talking. This lesson is about who Jesus Christ really is. Who he really is. So Jesus Christ said, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son, shall the son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father. With the holy angels. Do you remember in chapter 42? He said. I am Jehovah. That is my name. My glory. I will not give to another. My glory. I am not going to give to anybody else. Now Jesus is saying. uh, The son of man. Jesus is coming. In the glory of his Father. Not another glory. Because Jehovah God, as it were, the Father said, I ain't giving my glory away to nobody. And he also said, don't forget, beside me there is no Savior. And he also said, look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved. Because I'm God, I'm a just God, and beside me there is no Savior. Okay? Philippians 2.9 about Jesus. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, Jesus Christ, and given him, Jesus Christ, a name which is above every name. Now remember, Jehovah God said, unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Now he's saying that Jesus has a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess or swear that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He said, I'm not giving my glory away. Beside me there is no Savior. And, not, and every knee is going to bow unto me. Every tongue is going to confess. And now it's saying every knee is going to bow to Jesus. Every tongue is going to confess. He's coming in the glory of his Father, which he said he would not give to another. So when you see Jesus Christ of the New Testament, you are seeing Jehovah God of the Old Testament that became flesh and dwelt among us. He's the Old Testament God become flesh. That's the reason. And the Jews felt like the Apostle Paul was a heretic for worshiping Jesus as God. This is why in Acts 24, he said, After the way which is called heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. When I worship Jesus Christ of the New Testament, I'm worshiping Moses' God. I'm worshiping Abraham's God. I'm worshiping Isaac and Jacob's God. I'm worshiping David's God. I'm worshiping Isaiah's God. I'm worshiping Nehemiah's God. They call it heresy, but after the way that's called heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. Jesus Christ of the New Testament is Jehovah God of the Old Testament. I know you've never seen this before. I I can see myself in a wheelchair. I know you've never seen this before. Okay? God is a spirit. He cannot die. He has no blood to shed. Jesus said, a spirit hath not flesh and bones. Has no blood to shed. The Bible says he tempteth no man, neither indeed can be tempted. 
So God is a spirit, has no blood to shed. He cannot die and he can't be tempted. Okay? So, and he said, there's one of me. And beside me, there's no Savior. So how is this God, if, we're, if he's the Savior, we have to look unto him to be saved. And there's no God beside him, no Savior beside him. And yet, we're going to bow our knee to him. And in the New Testament, we're going to bow our knee and swear that Jesus is Lord. Then how does this work? Okay? God can't die. Has no blood to shed. Can't be tempted. Is a spirit. But there's a virgin girl by the name of Mary. And he overshadows Mary. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Through Mary, when she gave birth at that manger in Bethlehem, Amen. What was seen is this God who is a spirit became flesh and dwelt among us. This is why John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without Him was not anything made which was, was made. Verse 10, verse 14 John 1, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father. The Spirit overshadowed Mary, and she begat unto us a child. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. This God that couldn't bleed came to live in a body that could bleed. This God that couldn't be tempted came to live in a body whereby he could be in all points tempted. It behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. This God that cannot die made a way through that body whereby he could taste death for every man. And when they hung him on a tree and the Bible said he Gave up the ghost. And they took him. And they put him in a sepulcher. But they couldn't kill the spirit. And the spirit re-entered that body. And the resurrection power. And he ascended him on high. And he glorified him. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When you see Jesus Christ of the New Testament, you're seeing Jehovah God of the Old Testament. We are monotheistic, brother. One God and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's why it's possible to know the name and not know the name. But the word Jesus, Jesus means Yah, Jehovah, Savior. That's what the word means. Jehovah, Savior. Jehovah has become salvation. That's what the name Jesus means. That's why the angel told Mary, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Can you imagine using that name as a curse word? Can you imagine? Every knee's gone about that ever lived before him that sits upon the throne at the great white throne of judgment. If somehow a human being kept down and he lived to be 70 years of age, one sin a day, 
they're going to have to give an answer for 25,000 sins. How many tens of thousands from America alone on a daily basis are using the name of Jesus as a filthy curse word? And they're going to see Him on the throne! That's why we love that name. By His mercy, we revere it. And that He would reveal it to us. Listen. And let us take on that name in baptism. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There ain't nothing like having the name of Jesus applied and there's nothing like having the Spirit of Jesus come to live in your heart through the power of the Holy Ghost and you'll know you got Him because He'll begin to speak in a language you never learned before. As the sign that you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, 2 Corinthians 4 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. For this God, who commanded the light, to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When the light comes on, and we realize when you see Jesus of the New Testament, you're seeing the light of the glory of Jehovah God. In his face. Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. That's what happened when unto us a child was born. And a son was given. Okay. Second Corinthians 5.19. Here we go. To wit that God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Okay. This Jehovah God, he would introduce himself as El Shaddai, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Moses would need to know God as a mighty deliverer. It's Jehovah. And then there's Jehovah said, can you Jehovah? the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Rafika, or Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, uh, Jehovah Shama, the Lord is our man of uh, Lord Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is our man of war, introduced himself many times throughout the Old Testament, depending on what attribute of his nature he wanted to reveal. Okay? But he anointed prophet after prophet, which prophet after prophet was rejected. So he said, okay, I'll come myself. He overshadows Mary Unto us a child born, a son is given. But he's now come to reconcile mankind unto himself. He's not sending another. He's not sending a prophet. He himself is coming. To wit, God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. He didn't send another He came himself. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and he's committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. When I'm teaching today about who Jesus is, that's part of the ministry of reconciliation. You find out who he is and what he can do for you because of who he was. It's awesome. It's awesome. Now, notice this. Old Testament. Old Testament. Nehemiah 9.6. 
He had a revelation of this one God. Nehemiah said, Thou, even thou art Jehovah, L-O-R-D caps, alone. Thou, Jehovah, hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are in, the seas and all that is therein. Thou preservest them all, the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Nehemiah understood Jehovah God was the creator and that he made all those things. Revelation 3.14 Unto the church, excuse me, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, that's the people of the city of Laodicea, write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And that's talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He is the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Okay? How? Okay, I'm going to wrap my brain around this. Okay? Jesus is born in Bethlehem. How is he the beginning of the creation of God? Okay? I've done this before. But I, repetition is the mother of teaching. God is a spirit. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do it? God said, he said, let there be light. There was light. Okay. John 1 and 1. Okay. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made which was made. So, how can Jesus be the beginning of the creation of God? I want you to get this, okay? For just a moment. If it wasn't for those lights there, from those windows, I would at this point try, but we wouldn't turn in everything off and make this auditorium as dark as it could be. But let's just do this. If I can do it and not lose you. Close your eyes. Close them. For just a moment, pretend you're God. For some, it might be easier than others. But anyway, just pretend that you're God. There's no height, no depth, no length, no breadth. No stars, no moon, no sun. There's nothing but you. You're it. And then... God said, let there be light. So let's, let's, let's say, let there be light. Let there be light. Open your eyes. And there's light. Now, what came first? The light or your words? You expressed yourself. And as it were, the lights came on. God is a spirit. And he spoke. So the beginning was God's expression. He expressed himself. In the beginning was the expression. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Amen. By him were all things made. Without him was not anything made which was made. Everything was spoken into existence. I just read recently, Victor Hugo made this statement. He said, God is behind all things. And all things, therefore, hide him. People get so caught up in all of this that's being created, they forget that behind all of this, there was a creator that started it all. And many people can't see him. They can't see the creator for the creation. But he's behind it all. And he likes to reveal himself and he likes to conceal himself. Depending on the heart. Depending if your heart is honest and hungry. He'll reveal himself to you. But if you don't want the light to come on, you can sit in darkness forever. And we don't want that. So Jesus 
who caused the light to shine out of darkness has caused the light of the glory of God to shine in our hearts. We see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay, so Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God because he is God's expression. He he expressed himself. This is why in Hebrews 1, God who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, by whom also he made the worlds. He spoke it all into existence. Okay, so we're out of time for today. So obviously we'll come back, but I can't leave this right here. Okay. Remember Nehemiah, the one true God, this is be our last deal. Thou Jehovah alone by yourself made the heaven and the heavens of heaven. You made the host, the earth, all things that are in the seas, everything in Colossians 1, 15 and nine, speaking of Jesus, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. He was the Word. God expressed Himself. And that is the Logos. So now He expresses Himself by coming through Mary's loins, God. And He's expressed Himself in these last days by His Son. For by Him... By Jesus Christ, by the Logos, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And brothers and sisters, think with me. Think with me that that Jehovah God would like to see me and you included in the wonderment of his revelation and of his glory. Jesus said, many kings and prophets and righteous men desire to see the things you see and hear the things you hear, i.e. know the things you know, but they were hidden but he likes to reveal them as it were unto babes that he would take a 19 year old hippie. That's my story. And you folks, all of the stories where we came from and start revealing who he is to us is awesome. And it's beautiful and it's miraculous. I think we need to stand and we need to worship him and thank him. God, you are so precious.